Hello everyone. Welcome to Fulton County Library System Imagination Station Storytime. Storytime for elementary aged kids. My name is Miss Adrian and I am the children's librarian at the Adams Park Branch. Um, today we have a very special story time. Okay, we are going to be reading Jim Henson, The Guy Who um, Played With Puppets by Katherine Kroll. And if you know, Jim Henson is the guy who created um, the Muppets and today would have been his 84th birthday. So we're gonna have, we're gonna learn about him today. Um, before we get started with um, story time, I wanted to mention to you first that um, today's story um, is available on eReads Kids. It is also available, the hard copy of this book is available, you can place it on hold um, at fullcolibrary.org and you can um, arrange to pick it up for, with curbside pickup at your local library. If you have any questions about that, you can go to um, fullcolibrary.org. Okay, I also wanted to mention that September is library card sign up month. And if you don't have a library card, have your mom and dad go to focolibrary.org um, and you can sign up for a card there. Let's go ahead and get started. Jim Henson, The Guy Who Played With Puppets by Katherine Kroll. And um, the paintings, the illustrator was Stephen Johnson and Lou Fancher. Now, here's a picture. This is a picture of Jim Henson. Jim Henson's family didn't have a TV. No one had a TV in the 1930s. So how could a lively boy entertain himself? By kicking off his shoes and loving his life along the Mississippi River? A creek hobbled right past Jim's big old farmhouse. That's where he and his brother Paul fished and swam. On hot, humid nights, they watched fireflies flickering and listened to frogs croaking nonstop in the swamps, listening, watching, singing, and telling stories. That was entertainment. Daydreaming and nature watching, daydreaming and nature watching kept him busy observing the animals and birds of Leland, Mississippi. He took care of his pets, his dog Tone, Toby, his pony, turtle, snakes, frogs. He drew what he saw and also what he imagined, filling notebooks with creatures he made up. At his grandparents' house, he liked to listen to his cousins trying to top each other with hilarious stories at the dinner table. He was closer to his grandmother than anyone else in his family. For hours, they would sit at the porch rocking back and forth as she stitched beautiful quilts or painted or told him stories and most important, listen to his. Usually he kept his thoughts to himself. He didn't like to bother people. With friends, including a best friend named Kermit, he played games, not team sports. He was always last to be chosen. But ping pong and tennis and board games. He put on shows for the family in the backyard using props he found around the house, a sheet and towel from his mother's linen closet, perfect as a cloak and turban while he played a flute to cast a spell on the coiled garden hose posing as a snake. Okay, boys and girls, let's look at that picture. Okay, this picture, um, when Jim Henson was a was a was a um, little boy, he was a. This might have been okay to do, but now um, this would this isn't something that we would that we would do. This would this would be offensive and it would hurt people's feelings. So that's why when we're reading and we see pictures that might upset us, 
That's why we like what we're doing now. We talk about that. Or you ask adults, um, you know, if you see something in a book that you don't quite understand or it might hurt your feelings, that's why you ask questions. Okay? Let's continue. As he made his first public appearance as a Cub Scout, while a fellow scout tried to tell jokes, Jim stood behind him, wrapped his arms around his friend's chest, and waved a white handkerchief in his face. Everyone giggled, making people laugh. To Jim, that was magic. In search of more, in, in search of more, he performed in school plays, working his behind stage as well. TV, but but he and Paul built their own crystal radio set. Jim hurried home from school to catch action shows like The Green Hornet and The Shadow. On Sunday nights, he loved a comedy with ventriloquist Edgar Berman talking to his dummy, a wooden puppet named Charlie McCarthy. Here's a picture. This is Charlie McCarthy. Comic strips and books fed his imagination. He was especially impressed with the way L. Fron Baum created a world alive with details in the Oz series. He wrote poetry and he kept drawing, illustrating every school report, whether the teachers asked him to or not. Saturday afternoons were going to the movies. Um, the first one he ever saw was MGM's The Wizard of Oz. It remained his favorite once he got over being scared by the lion's roar that started every movie at the MGM. Jim's 13 years stood out. A daily newspaper published one of his cartoons, his first appearance in print. By now, his family was living in Hyattsville, Maryland. TV sets were showing up in some homes, and Jim nagged his parents nonstop to buy one. They resisted, worrying that TV was a bad influence on children. But in 1950, they gave in. The set was small with fuzzy images in black and white, but TV connected people like his family as they gathered in the living room to watch shows together, shows that were actually being filmed somewhere else. Magic. He liked many programs, especially a puppet show called Kukla, Fran, and Ollie. And here's the puppets from that show. It started a group of cloth puppets called the Kuklapatan Players. It made his whole family laugh. His father, a biologist, wanted Jim to prepare for a career in science. Too late, within a few years, Jim was looking for a TV job. Playing with puppets seemed a promising idea. Puppets struck some people as babyish, but Jim really wanted to go on TV now. He checked out books from the library and joined his high school's puppet club as a way to learn how to make them. One day he saw an ad, a Saturday morning show needed young people to work with marionettes, working the strings of these traditional puppets. Jim and a friend built Pierre, that French rat built two cowboy puppets, Longhorn and Shorthorn, and answered the ad. They got the job. At 16, Jim was on TV playing with puppets. His father was sure puppets could not provide a proper career. So in college, Jim tried taking science courses, but art classes won out. They were so much more fun, even if they were often in the home economics department. He was one of six men amid 500 future wives and mothers majoring in home ec with its classes in puppetry, costume design, and advertising art. While still in college, Jim got his very own TV show, Sam and Friends, hosted by a bald puppet named Sam. This five minute puppet comedy ran twice a day on a Washington DC channel.
Jim wanted his creatures to be able to smile or frown or express any emotion. So instead of wood, he used flexible furry fabrics to make Marshmallow, Icky Gunk, and the others. For Sam's friend Kermit, he cut up his mom's old green cloth coat and stitched it into a funny shape. Then he stuck on eyes made from ping pong ball from a ping pong ball he cut in half. He liked to make eyeballs slightly crossed for a funnier look. Okay, let's talk about that, the way he created his puppets. Okay. I know that um that when he mentioned um how he, he made the eyeball slightly crossed for a funnier look. We know that um, people look different and that could, that could be hurt feelings and because, um, because somebody might, you know, somebody might have, um, someone might look different, like have eyes that are slightly crossed or something like that. Um, that was just Jim Henson being creative. We know that everyone is beautiful in their own ways and everyone is created creative in their own ways. Okay, and um, that was how he chose to make Kermit, but just because um, he made the eyes a certain way, that doesn't mean that, you know, um, or someone might look different they're still they're they're beautiful and they're special just like jim henson made kermit special let's continue he practiced for hours in front of a mirror trying to get his puppets movements and expressions just right voicing silly witty thoughts he normally kept to himself he got rid of the usual boxy stage for puppets. The TV screen was now the stage. That meant squatting below the camera's range and holding puppets over his head, getting sore arms from keeping them in action. Taking advantage of the new technology of color TV, he filled sets with vivid hues. Jim asked Jane Neville, a woman from his puppetry class, to help out. They started calling their creations Muppets. Just a fun word to say, sort of a combination of marionettes and puppets. Sam and friend ran for six successful years. Those who worked with Jim were impressed. The kid is positively a genius, a phenomenon with everyone from kids to great grandmothers. We had never seen anything like that before. Jim drove to his college graduation in a secondhand Rolls Royce that he'd brought himself and received his degree from the home economics department. Still a grown man playing with puppets. Even Jim had his doubts. He sailed off to Europe to paint. In his free time, he went to puppet shows and met famous puppeteers, proud to be working in what he considered a serious art form there. He learned that the puppets, that for centuries, people all over the world had used puppets for ceremonies, entertainment, debate, and much more. Returning to the United States, Jim no longer felt puppets were childish. He formed a company called Muppets Incorporated and married Jane. All during the 1960s, the Henson's Muppets made watching TV commercials fun. They starred in hundreds of commercials, selling everything from detergent to dog food. Jim and Muppets like Kermit started making audiences laugh with their guest appearances on popular TV programs like the Ed Sullivan Show. At the same time, Jim experimented with other ways of letting his imagination soar, such as making films. Some projects worked, some didn't, but a failure never stopped him trying something new. His moments of inspiration came when he was relaxing outside or on a comfy chair in his office. He never forgot a certain tree in California awestruck at the beauty of nature. Leaves flickering in the sun on whatever paper was handy. He would take his favorite bright colored felt tips pens and begin sketching. 15 years after introducing the Muppets, Jim was 33 and a famous guy on TV.
One day in 1968, he got a phone call that would change his life. It was from a TV producer named Joan Gantz Cooney. She told him about studies showing the vast difference that preschool education made in children's lives. Poor children usually had to had no access to it, but they did have TVs. Could TV be used to teach? And would this would his Muppet Company help her new shore show for preschoolers? Jim hesitated. The show had a weird name, Sesame Street. Joan explained that just as the command opened Sesame in the old Arabian tale opened a door to treasure, she wanted her show to open doors to young, in young minds. Jim wasn't sure he wanted to limit his Muppets to children, but years of watching his own children convinced him he'd always studied them, figuring out what made them laugh. laugh. Listening to their stories, encouraging their imaginations. Maybe TV could be a good influence during a frightening time when some felt the country was falling apart. Maybe this could be his contribution to help change it for the better. At least he'd be the fun guy, the guy who made sure the show, for all its noble goals, didn't get too preachy. Plus, it was his, a big experiment. Jim loved to experiment. Along with a team of brilliant writers and musicians at Joan's new children's television workshop, Jim's company got busy. Kermit the Frog was ready to go. Soon came a crabby creature who lived in a garbage can, Oscar the Grouch. Then two quite different friends named Bert and Ernie, a hungry guy named Cookie Monster, a really big bird named Big Bird, and many more. Jim worked hard sketching each new Muppet in the brightest of colors, then guiding its creation. He was the spark behind each Muppet's personality and voice, which made learning letters, numbers, and all sorts of concepts weirdly appealing. Working with all the other creative people, he spoke so softly that they had to lean in to hear him. He would burst out laughing at their clever ideas or say, hmm, if he saw room for improvement. Lovely was his highest compliment, or else he'd murmur, I think it could be funnier. Sesame Street launched on November 10, 1969. Jim zoomed around the set, getting the ultimate puppet show ready to go. He was the high-pitched voice of Ernie and Kermit and other Muppets, and he contributed short animated films he'd produced for the show. He even made a rare appearance as himself, juggling three balls in a counting skit. Three balls was his line. This show was unique, using laughter to help preschool children learn and never talking down to them. Everyone used words like noble, exciting, and revolutionary to describe it. Bert, Ernie, and others became best friends to millions of children around the world getting ready for school. Sesame Street went on to win many awards and become the most influential and longest running children's program in history. Jim's Muppets were vital to the show's success, inspiring witty dialogue and hilarious stories. They were a lot like real kids, cute, cuddly, giddy, greedy, grinning, not perfect or sweet. They were just so much fun. Jim's own five children, Lisa, Cheryl, Brian, John, and Heather, kept inspiring him and went on to help the show in various ways, traveling between his six homes with many more plans up his sleeve. Jim supervised movie and TV projects that used other ways of playing with puppets. The Muppets helped, launch, helped introduce the first season of Saturday Night Live in 1975 and then started in their own show the following year, The Muppet Show with Kermit, Miss Piggy, and eventually some 400 others was for all ages. It was Jim's dream to create a show for the whole family, the kind of entertainment that would, that would have loved 
that he would have loved with his family back in Mississippi. The Muppets became the most popular puppets in the history of the world, um, coaxing giggles from as many as 235 million people each week. Um, Jim went on to make several hit Muppet movies and also worked on other people's projects. He helped with the creation of Jetty Master Yoda in Star Wars, The Emperor's Empire Strikes Back, for example, and assisted the creatures in Teenage Mutant Ninja Turtles movies. And he kept making, ex he, and he kept making ex experimental films with his own puppets, but not the adorable Muppets. Not everyone loved those serious movies like The Dark Crystal or Labyrinth at first, but his experiments seemed endless. It was heartbreaking to everyone who knew him and to millions who didn't when Jim Henson died unexpectedly after a short illness at the age of 53. Thousands came to his, to his memorial service as he had wished. Everyone wore bright colors and a jazz band from New Orleans played lively tunes. At the end, people waved butterfly puppets of every hue, celebrating him and his work with his vivid imagination and playful way with puppets, Jim Henson made a difference in this world. Okay, the end. At the back of the book, they have some, um, some books and websites about Jim Henson, the Muppets, and Sesame Street. I also wanted to mention that we have, um, available for curbside pickup you have we have dvds and we have books on um some of the dvds on the muppet movies the muppet show um some books on um some non-fiction books on jim henson that you can place on hold and and pick them up for curbside pickup i hope you enjoyed today's um story time and we will see you next time for at imagination station bye now